are literally shaping the planet. Purpose is the only pathway to a regenerative future. We have a choice to stay with the status quo or to change. What is the point of trying to be just resilient when we can actually innovate? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, pleasure to be here um, in my bedroom. Um, so thank you for that um, very long introduction. I'm so sorry. Um, but one of the key things um, there was that um, I curated um, the Oslo Architecture Chanale, um, co-curated, um, and we were looking at architecture and degrowth or post-growth or anti-growth or there are so many sort of different ways of thinking about it um, and so what I want to talk about today is mostly related to the research there and um, sort of just talking about why we need to escape economic growth but I've just brought in a few things around to kind of foreground it around the current situation with COVID so um, that's why I've made my presentation too long but hopefully it will be of interest. Um, so everybody's probably seen this cartoon a few times now um it's um yeah so here we are facing COVID-19 that's the immediate concern on many many people's minds but behind that we also have a an economic recession that we are already facing and the fallout from that that looks to be pretty scary for many um and then behind that there's this climate change um, and then I've seen other versions of this where there's another one behind that talking about kind of biodiversity collapse um, so you know this little thing here be sure to wash your hands and all will be well um, is obviously not the case um, but I worry about the kind of um, I worry about the kind of way that this is presented as like a series of kind of onslaughts that don't actually uh, have that interaction with each other or, or even even kind of competing interests um, and that horrible um, that horrible headline not now Greta was really really terrifying to see you know we need to acknowledge that these things are all super interconnected so this is very crude but um, I've just had a go at kind of trying to uh, um, draw how these things are connected at a very 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 high level so we're all pretty familiar and now accepting that our unsustainable resource and land use are driving greenhouse gas emissions, which is driving climate breakdown and ecological breakdown. And that unsustainable resource and land use is also directly driving ecological breakdown. And we've, I think, largely come to accept that as a civilization now. So great. Um, but the other thing that I think is really important to understand is that the COVID-19 pandemic is also a result of ecological breakdown and have, has been driven through unsustainable resource and land use. Um, and I think that's, you know, there's, there's been a lot of things kind of published about this and it's been in discussion now sort of for a few months, it was a little bit more fringe, I think early in the pandemic and lockdown, but um, I just wanted to point out kind of, this is largely what's happening there, you know, we think. Um, so our demand for resources is perpetuating the invasion of wild landscapes um, and that causes ecosystems to be degraded and habitat loss and then this forces species into ever kind of more confined spaces and therefore there are new and unusual interactions between species um, and this creates a really kind of ripe ground for pathogens to be jumping from species to species, including humans. Then our globalized society distributes infectious diseases very, very efficiently. And what's even worse is that the polluted environment that we've created makes it very, very difficult to recover. So I think it's really important to understand that the COVID-19 pandemic is one of the terrifying faces of ecological breakdown, as opposed to a competing interest for it, because that's going to change the way that we think about it going forward and how we need to try and battle it. So then kind of working our way further around the loop. So I think most of us are agreeing, seeing that the pandemic is causing a recession. Um, and I think we are doing better generally as well at acknowledging that climate breakdown and ecological breakdown also have negative impacts on our economic system as it stands. And we're seeing more and more kind of, you know, insurance companies and finances and this sort of, you know, um, and, and big kind of powerful forces within finance and economics, um, acknowledging that this is a problem for our current system as well. So this, this loop we're doing sort of, yeah, 
this, this section of the loop we're also acknowledging. But the problem that we, um, and then the, the problem is that we then see, okay, well, there's a recession. So therefore we need to pursue some economic growth in order to, you know, remove ourselves from the recession. And sort of that's the kind of contemporary receiver's wisdom. But the problem is that then the, the pursuit of economic growth, that pursuit of economic growth is further driving that unsustainable resource and land use. So we're getting this positive feedback loop that is, yeah, just spiraling out of control. So this purple arrow, this is this problem. And the problem, I think, is that we're not acknowledging that. We need to acknowledge that. Instead of acknowledging that, what we're doing is saying, no, we can reverse this angle we can actually see the uh, causes and uh, the opportunities from ecological breakdown, climate breakdown, as an opportunity to generate yet more growth and that we can create this magical kind of green growth that will allow us to sort of two birds with one stone. Um, and what I want to talk about here is how that, that that's actually not possible. And what we need to do is acknowledge that that pursuit of economic growth is in fact driving further unsustainable resource and land use and instead we need to find an alternative to this bottom arrow if we're going to break this cycle we need to find an alternative to sort of bringing us out of a the recession and maybe not the recession exactly but the kind of the, the symptoms of the recession the root causes of the recession um, and rather than pursuing further economic growth which is obviously going to be something that's more and more and more difficult in the face of the pandemic but again this is why it's so important to recognize that this is a this is a positive feedback loop that is causing us terrible problems um so yeah so just to dig into that a little bit then so we need to acknowledge that the pursuit of economic growth is driving ecological damage um, if we look back track back sort of this is just since the 70s but we could go further back we look at global gdp global material footprints and global carbon dioxide emissions these things have been tracking along nicely together for a long, long time. Um, and there is just very, very, very little evidence to suggest that they could ever do otherwise. Um, there are sort of small pockets of that, and I'll go into that a bit more later. But in general, what we're seeing is these things have all been increasing together. If you then look at it as a sort of rather than over time, but as a per kind of country basis. So here, this is GDP per capita and CO2 emissions per capita, you can see again that there is a kind of uh, a correlation between these two factors. And if you look back, so now, to, now we're looking back since the 60s, um, that, and this is for the whole world, that the only times that CO2 emissions have gone down is because there has also been an economic downturn of some variety. And if this graph continued to the kind of middle of this year, then we'd be seeing the blips that we were seeing at the beginning of the lockdown. Um, as well. So yeah, these things are really, really closely tied together and we have to acknowledge that those things are tied together. Um, but moreover, the economic growth that we are pursuing and wanting to pursue because of the social benefits that we believe that it brings, um, that's also faltering. So if we look at, for example, GDP per capita against the social progress index, so this index that takes into account things like um, equality and distribution of resources and things like that, um, we, and uh, life expectancy, and the, uh, it's a whole host of factors, we can see that an increase in GDP per capita for a while does bring those benefits, but then after a while, it just really starts to flatten out and other factors become more dominant. So continuing, you know, the idea that we can continue to pursue increasing GDP and that's going to keep bringing that social progress just isn't bearing out. Um, and similarly, if we look at life satisfaction, this is a self-reported life satisfaction, but again, you see benefits for a bit and then things start to flatten out and other factors are becoming more dominant in determining life satisfaction. Um, and in fact, if we look at the kind of the growth rate for change in life satisfaction and change in growth, then it's just flat. There's no, there's no uh, yeah, there's no um, positive and worthwhile correlation between these things. So it's not bringing us those social benefits. It's not even bringing us the prosperity that it's promising. Not really, because what we're seeing is if you look at the genuine progress indica indicator and how that's changed compared to GDP per capita and how that's changed, and this is for the US, yes, GDP has increased since the 50s to 2000 per capita, but 
the ge uh, genuine progress indicators, so including things like you know, uh, the purchasing power of your dollar and your access to resources and so on, these things haven't changed. Um, and one of the massive reasons for this is the deepening inequality that we have seen. Um, and this is just like, such a shocking graph um, showing that you know, the bottom 50% have seen none of the benefits of the increase in wealth. So many of the benefits have just gone and that's like top 1% there is that red line increasing, seeing the spoils of growth are not being shared equally. And we can see that in so many different ways. Um, and I think we all sort of know that. So it's not bringing the social benefits. It's not bringing the prosperity, except for to a very, very few people, but it's not gen largely bringing the prosperity that it gives. And it is causing us all of these environmental um, and social problems. And yet, we still kind of maintain it as the primary indicator of success for governments all over the world. And this is just a kind of slightly funny um, graphic kind of comparing every state in the US with um, a different entire other country. And, you know, I could have used any kind of any number of graphics to illustrate this point. But the point is that we look at countries and the success of countries and the progress of countries around its GDP. And this is like it's such a massive driver um, but this is deeply, deeply problematic for those reasons that I'm outlining. Um, but there's got to be a reason, like right? why? Why are we doing it? It's not just because we're all trying to like do a bit of one-upmanship. Um, and there are kind of there are a number of things, but there are four really important dependencies that we have on economic growth. Um, one of them is about maintaining employment, because as productivity increases um, due to largely technology. Um, we need to in continue to also continue to increase the size of the economy in, in order to maintain employment. If, that's, if maintaining employment is a thing that we want to do, which is obviously another policy question, not going to now, but at the moment that is, therefore we need to maintain that increase in GDP if we're going to keep this equation being as it is. We also need GDP in order to manage the effective size of our private debt. So, uh, we can kind of keep increasing that, you know, problems like the inflation of land values and uh, the kind of household debts that have been increasing. This is um, for the UK, but um, we can manage the effective size of those debts. If the economy is overall increasing, then it doesn't matter so much that I have this 20 year old debt that is, you know, now feels much, much smaller. And unfortunately, at the moment, we still have this a, quite a similar attitude to public debt, despite public debt being a very, very different game from private household debt. The government is not a household, um, and we don't have time to kind of go into all of that now. But we are still relying on economic growth in order to manage, you know, things like um, the paybacks on government bonds and so on, um, and to to manage the effective size of that public debt. And then perhaps one of the scariest reasons that we're relying on economic growth is to avoid having to tackle these other social problems like inequality and redistribution of wealth head on. Um, this myth that a, raising, a rising tide lifts all boats means that we don't actually have to deal with sort of pre-distribution policies and things like that that could become quite you know, electorally difficult. Um, but unfortunately, you know, it, it, this is starting, the cracks are starting to show in this game. Um, as well. And this is um, a graph showing the falling um, share of income that is due to sort of labour compared to the rest of the share that is due to sort of uh, return on your assets. Um, so yeah, this is this one of this is one of the reasons that the other graph showing the kind of 50% and the 1% is so stark. Um, so yeah, we try to avoid having to to, in order to avoid doing all of the kind of unpicking of all of these policies, we're relying on green growth to tackle climate change again, that kind of magical green arrow, because it's going to be, or it's perceived as that it's going to be very, very difficult to unpick those other systemic problems. Um, unfortunately, um, green growth, just it's just so vanishingly unlikely it's of course it's, it's, you shouldn't say things are impossible but I just want to illustrate how unlikely this is and some of the problems um, uh, that we're going to be yeah, yeah that we have to face in order to unpick that because yeah um, okay so what it would look like is sort of taking that graph is that the orange line would be continuing on up 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 you know in an exponential curve forever while meanwhile 
other environmental indicators such as carbon dioxide emissions and our material footprint would just like dive off a cliff and go down and go down and go down. So GDP would no longer be tied to that. Now, in order to achieve this, one of my sort of favorite things that I've heard around this is that to achieve this, we need the, the level of technology that we need would be the kind of thing where you're kind of creating energy in orbit outside of the Earth's atmosphere and microwave beaming it back to Earth in order to, you know, not cause the, the uh, excess heat energy within, the, within our atmosphere. I mean, it's like that level of technology um, that would be required to carry out this. And we obviously don't have the time to develop and roll that out at scale, given where we are in terms of climate emergency at the moment. So the problem is that um, we're not, we're still hoping that this is gonna work, that we are gonna have the technology somehow, magically. Um, and one of the kind of big, I guess, schools of thought um, that defends this is this idea of the environmental Kuznets curve, the idea that we will, as we get richer and richer and richer and richer, at some point we're going to be rich enough to solve this problem and our environmental impacts will start to reduce and the environment will improve. So that top left graph is this, is showing this concept. And this is from the UK government. This isn't, like, yeah. Um, and the top right graph is actually plotting the, um, plotting GDP per head against um, the carbon emissions and showing that this is happening. This is like, this is like yeah, we're, we are managing to achieve this. The problem is it's fiddling the numbers. The problem is, is that this is based on a reduction in CO2 emissions because we in the UK and in many countries have moved our heavy industries offshore and therefore they're not included in our accounting. This is a territorial based um, accounting um, and it's, it's literally fiddling the numbers and it's continuing to defend this really, really flawed argument. So the bottom, the graph on the bottom right there, the pale green line, that's showing how our territorial emissions in the UK have decreased over the last 40, 50 years. Um, but the problem is, is that the green, the dark green line, so that's all the emissions associated with everything that we consume. So if I, you know, build a, if I design a steel building and I specify that steel and that steel comes from, you know, Lancashire or something, then that would be included in the pale green line. Fine, because those emissions to create that steel are within the boundary. However, I do exactly the same thing, make exactly the same building, but I buy that steel from, say, India, then they're off my books. They're on India's books, they're no longer my problem. And yet it is me that is specifying that material and is driving that demand. But we're not taking responsibility for that. And in fact, it's in, we're incentivizing the further outsourcing of these emissions to other sort of other parts of the world. And this is, uh, yeah, a massive problem. <laughs> so I think I'm, yeah, okay. So yeah, we're not achieving green growth at the moment. And I suppose the question then is, well, could we? Um, and unfortunately, it appears not. And I have a few more slides that I know I don't have time to go through, um, but I'm just going to race through. So we've talked about the reasons. That basically, these are showing some reasons that we can't achieve it. Um, what the evidence that we've seen so far that is in support of green growth being possible all seems to be actually an externalization, externalization of that of those emissions. So we don't actually have any examples that decoupling is possible. I'm going to skip over some of these. Another problem is insufficient technological change. So as we're talking about, you know, kind of microwaves beaming energy into onto the surface. Um, this is a diagram from Absolute Zero, which is a report from the University of Cambridge, and it speaks to the importance of planning our deep route to net zero based on existing technologies that we have. It is completely foolhardy to hope that new technologies are going to emerge or that emerging technologies are going to scale at the speed that we need in order to make this. And what we should do is plan to meet this with our existing technologies. And in terms of the impact on the built environment, we have the existing technology. We have the te technologies around to build in a low carbon way and to maintain our buildings in a low carbon way and to retrofit our existing buildings so that they are less um, energy intensive and therefore not emitting. You know, this all exists. Um, 
So this is good news. Um, the, another reason is there's a limited potential of recycling. Absolutely, we should be recycling as much as possible. And this is a really cool example from uh, the Lendiger Group in Copenhagen of a building that is um, made of uh, recycled brick walls. They haven't even sort of taken the bricks apart. But we can't recycle more than 100% of everything. So recycling and a circular economy and um, reuse and so on are all absolutely important but what they will enable is for us to maintain our existing level of resource use and that should be much 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 better distributed by the way but they can't allow us to increase our resource use which is what we're doing at the moment um, then there's this massively underestimated environmental impact of services there's this kind of idea that you know oh the internet is free and that there is no you know that uh, carbon footprint of the internet is sort of bigger than flying you know we just don't have this appreciation and I think this is something that just needs to dig into our collective imaginary and there are sort of lots of examples of um, the weightless sort of revealing the false weightlessness of technology um, such as this um, project in Odense also in um, Denmark um, there's this point about reducing energy expenditures. So in general, the easiest, the first stuff is the, is the easiest to get hold of. This first stuff that you extract is the sort of the least energy intensive. So as we get further and further into our, our mines of raw materials, whatever they are, um, it's not gonna take less energy to extract those, it's gonna take more energy to extract those. So this is working against that decoupling of particularly material footprint and GDP growth. Um, and then there's this problem shifting that I like to call it the whack-a-mole effect, but like you solve one problem and you're accidentally causing another problem. And the, the, the big thing at the moment that um, comes up quite a lot is yes, okay, we want to move to electric vehicles um, and we want to much move to much more um, electricity use. And therefore the battery storage of that requires a huge amount of like, things like cobalt and lithium ion. So do we even actually have the, you know the raw materials within a reasonable um reasonably accessible um case to meet those demands if those demands are going to keep going up 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 we're obviously going to run off um run out and it's so important to think about these things in systems and how one thing might you know cause problems elsewhere um I think almost finally, so I'm doing quite a long time, um, rebound effects. So this is not another reason that this decoupling is impossible, um, is that if you make something more accessible, cheaper, for whatever reason, then generally, almost always what happens is not that we use less of it, it's that we then use more of it, because we're still willing to spend the same amount of time, effort, energy, whatever. Um, and actually, as we see, it's even worse than that. Like that the accumulation of access to energy and resources and so on in smaller hands means that that has ballooned even further because when, there's, um, when that energy and resources and carbon kind of uh, embodied carbon is being used not for, to, for meeting basic needs but for more uh, like high consumption lifestyles, then it's been shown to sort of have an even greater effect. So this kind of, yeah, inequality problem is actually further exacerbating our environmental problems. Um, and yeah, one way that architecture a lot is talking about being able to, um, being, being able to counter that is to build in to the way that we're, to, to cities and to the way that we're um, thinking about how we live, those kinds of pre-distribution policies. So policies to actually prevent those kind of inequalities from occurring in the first place. It's like a really cute illustration from um, the UK co-housing network, but co-housing, sharing stuff, having infrastructure from sharing. And it's lots of like super cute things but, um, that can sometimes be, even be off-putting, but like being able to share, you know, kitchens, laundries and things like that just makes such a huge, huge difference. So, yeah, so just to sum up then, um, degrowth is a movement that recognises that sustainability is impossible under the growth paradigm and seeks alternatives that instead of placing kind of economic growth at the heart, place social environmental flourishing at the heart. And there's here are some of my favourite degrowth reports and books. I recommend them all. 
Um, the Less Is More book on the right, um, it's just been out for a couple of months and it's get, just get everybody to read it. It's written in a, sort of a really accessible and fantastic way. Um, also, the Escaping Growth and Dependency report from Positive Money is, is a really, really good um, resource as well. I mean, they all are, but in different ways, yeah. Um, so, yeah, final slide is we need to acknowledge that this positive feedback loop is problematic, that it's real and that it's super problematic. And the site of intervention that we have is to try and find a different way out of perceived economic uh, problems rather than redoubling down on economic growth which is causing all of these problems is to find an alternative economic model that is around that is based around the equitable distribution of scarce resources thank you